Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year to you. It's great to see you guys. You know what? One of my New Year's resolutions this year is to smile more. I was, <laughs> Chloe's right here on the front row taking some pictures. She said, you got to smile today because Josh says every picture they have of you, you look mean. So, <laughs> so I'm going to do my best to smile. We got one of those faces, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, hey, we're glad you are here today. Thank you so much for being here, kicking off a brand new series, kicking off a brand new year. And uh, we're just really excited to be a part of what's going on in your life, and you can be a part of what's happening here, and it's just an amazing thing. I'm so excited about 2020 and all the things that are in front of us, some changes coming our way, uh, some improvements coming our way, lots of things that we're working on and doing, and we're just excited about it. So kicking off a brand new series called I Love This Place, I just want to mention to you, if, in case you're new, maybe you're kind of returning to church after a little while, maybe Forest Park, this is the first time you've been here, if you go to our app and you can find that at fplive.app, fplive.app, you'll find the message notes there. Put all the scriptures there for you, because I do bounce around sometimes in different translations and use this or use that or put a long passage but only read a portion of it live. All of that's printed for you on in the app, so you can follow along. You can take notes inside that. You can save it. You can email it to yourself. You can just do a variety of different things. We put links in there. If there's a book that we happen to be using kind of as a guide or maybe a large quote or something, we put that in there for you as well, uh, et cetera. So if you go to fplive.app, you can you look at the message notes there, or you can go to uversion, that's at bible.com, and you can find the, the notes there as well. So there are lots of different tools that you can use to help you stay engaged and help you as you you know, find something that you want to remember, put a quote, take a picture. You can put that on Facebook. You can, you know, send the notes to yourself later, whatever you want to do. Hopefully, you'll find that uh, user-friendly. You know, occasionally, people approach me after a Sunday morning service or while I'm enjoying coffee at Muddy's or uh, uh, when I'm trying to find Jesus at Walmart, which I typically do not. I'm not able to find him there. Uh, or they'll personally, you know, message me or send me an email or something like that, and they'll say, you know, I just want you to know, Scott, I love Forest Park Church. I love it. And every single time someone says that to me, my heart, you know, is just, it, it swells. I'm just so excited. I'm like, yes, that's what we're talking about. That's what it's about. I love people when they connect and they say, I love being a part of this place. I love Forest Park. I love what's happening here. And many of you who attend here, uh, you've said that to me on numerous occasions or different ways, or you've heard someone else say that to you, maybe a family member or a friend or a neighbor or something like that. I mean, most of us sitting in this room and, you know, love Forest Parker, we wouldn't be here. Now, I'm not so naive to assume everybody who attends here loves it because some of you might be here because your husband drug you here or, you know, your kids come and they enjoy it. So you are doing the best you can to appease them and you're just kind of enduring it. Or maybe you've, you've decided to stay over from the Christmas, New Year's holidays and they, they pulled you to church this morning before you drive home this afternoon or tomorrow. And again, you're just kind of enduring church this morning here at Forest Park. But most people who attend here on a consistent basis loves it or they wouldn't be here. And I've thought a lot about why. Maybe you've asked yourself, why is it? What is it about Forest Park that I love? Uh, wh why is it that we, we spend our time and energy and money, as Brad was talking about a moment ago, and more and more people automating their giving? Why is that? I was thinking through that this past week. There's several reasons why. One, our whole theme of no, no perfect people allowed. We welcome all. We do the best we possibly can to make room for everyone. It doesn't really matter where you are on your spiritual journey. Uh, none of us are perfect. We don't have it all together. We all struggle with different things in our life, and we don't make excuses for sins or excuses for particular struggles, but we do acknowledge them, and we say, hey, you're welcome no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, there's a place for you. Also, our volunteers, that's another reason why. Just an amazing group of amazing people. Rich, poor, black, white, men, women, straight, gay, believers, doubters, conservatives, liberals, and they all jump in and serve wherever they possibly can, from the parking lot to the kids to the lobby. Uh, to in here, to the band, to the tech team, on and on it goes. Also our band. I mean, you just listen to our band. We just got an incredible group of singers and musicians. I can't say enough about that. Outreach from, you know, food giveaways to the Angel Project where we just served 450 children to coats and blankets that we collect throughout the year. Uh, Uganda trip, Ecuador trip, different things going on throughout the year. Our kids and students team. 
We have a group of people in this church love our kids, love our students. They serve them week after week. After, and we could go on and on and on as to why so many people love Forest Park. And over the next few weeks, we're going to discover what about Forest Park makes me makes my family, makes you, makes your family, several hundred people. What is it that makes them get up early on a Sunday morning? What is it makes them, we have, we've had people here this morning since about, I don't even know, probably seven o'clock, 6.45, seven o'clock, to make sure things are working well, make sure things, why, why do people do that? Why is there such a priority when they've got jobs and they've got kids and they've got other things to do? So we're going to talk about that over the next few weeks. And more importantly, not just brag about what's going on here, but how can we, as the leadership of the church, how can we as staff members, how can we as the people who kind of, you know, really are the backbone behind what you see, how can we partner with you better? How can we come alongside you and help you connect more, grow more, and become the person that you were designed and created to be. And I'd guess if we went around this room this morning and we ask you, hey, tell us why, why is it that you like Forest Park? Why do you show up? Why do you come here? We would get a variety of different answers. Some people would say, well, Forest Park introduced me to Jesus. I didn't even know anything about Jesus. I only knew him as a, you know, just a, a religious icon, but Forest Park introduced me to him and radically changed my life. We'd get that all the way to, well, there's this hot girl that comes here and, you know, I'm playing the part, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just trying to go out with her. I don't know. And as I said, I'm not so naive as to, to, as to believe everybody here attend, you know, attends it, loves it. I'm sure there are some people who've attended and gone on and disliked it. Um, it's okay. You know, so we, we get that. But whatever the reason, has it ever occurred to you the reason why we hear I love this place is not accidental? Let me, let me say that again. Has it ever occurred to you the reason we hear I love this place is not accidental? What do you mean, Scott? I mean, it's intentional. We work hard. I mean, that's all there is to it. Our staff, our volunteers, people on this platform, people behind the scenes work diligently week in and week out to make sure people love it. Bill does not simply show up on Sundays and the band is ready to go. Okay, our tech team does not just pray technology works. Come to think of it, I'm not sure some of our tech team members pray at all. But anyway, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. They work hard, they get here, they make sure lights work, they make sure computers work. Allison, our kid venture director, they, they, she can't afford to merely show up on Sunday mornings and hope that the rooms are staffed with quality, loving, caring adults ready to receive your children, take care of your children, give your children back to you at the end of the day. Our Ecuador and Uganda team leaders do not say, well, hey, if you want to go, you know, show up at the airport and uh, we'll do the best we can to get you on the plane. And hopefully when you get to Uganda or Ecuador, we'll have a room for you to stay in. That, that's not the way it happens. I spend hours preparing messages. Bill spends hours getting things ready. Our tech team works diligently, sometimes late into the night. Our children's team gets here during the week and runs copies and makes sure rooms are ready to go and studies and prepares and all. Nothing you see happens by accident. But then again, another question can be asked. Why do all these people work so hard? Because uh, I grew up in church. In fact, there's never been a time in my life that I wasn't part of a church. I was a little child and you know, dedicated as, a, as an infant, went to church all my life, went to church three and four times a week for probably 20 years. I've always been part of a church. I have friends who lead churches around our nation. Many of you are, are part of churches. If you happen to be just a guest here today, you're part of churches or you grew up in churches, struggled all the time to find musicians, to find singers, to find tech people, to find leaders, to find people who will sit with our kids and teach them, outreach, to struggle, 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 can't seem to find it. Why, why do people here at Forest Park do it so well? Why do they show up week after week? Why do they give their money? Why do they give their hours? I was thinking about that this past week. And writing some things down that really just kind of erupted inside of me 
And there's many. We could probably give 20. But here are four pillars that I was looking at this past week. We, one, a radical message here at Forest Park. Two, a compelling vision. Three, a love for people. And four, a commitment to excellence. These four right here serve as pillars holding up what you see on Sunday mornings, whether you're local, whether it's local, or whether it is global. And in case anybody's wondering, these pillars rest on the foundation of Christ Jesus. Out of who he is, out of what he is, out of the church that he launched, there's a radical message, which we're going to get to in a moment, a compelling vision that comes from him, a love for people that he exhibited, a commitment to excellence not only did he live, but calls us to. I'm not sure you are aware, but every week, I'm talking about every week, unless there is some kind of you know, holiday that we've got or the offices are closed or something else is going on, every single week our team meets and discusses how well we serve you based on things just like this. We get together, sit around a table, we evaluate the message, we evaluate the vision, we evaluate the passion, we evaluate the clarity, we evaluate the quality, we evaluate every single thing we do here at Forest Park, everything. We constantly ask, how can we be better? How can we be more clear? How can we be more effective? We're always learning. I've been here for 18 years, and I'm telling you, there'll be something I learned this week I didn't know last week, and I will do my be- best to be better next week than I am this week. You know, on and on it goes. We're constantly tweaking, constantly trying to get better. Why? Why do we do this? For instance, why, why do we have a commitment to excellence? Why not just wing it for Jesus, you know? We'll show up and we'll do our best to sing, we'll do our best to teach. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've been part of churches at the end of the service, you think, I think they just winged that for Jesus. I think that's all that they did today. I've been there. Why, 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 why do we not do that? Why do we care so much? Why do we work so hard? Here it is from my heart. Hopefully it'll get inside of you if it's not there. I believe this with a passion. What we do, beyond any doubt, is the most important task on the planet. We do not fill time. We do not just do something because we don't, you know, well, Scott can't, you know, he can't sing, he, he, he can't play instruments, he, he's not very athletic. Um, maybe he should preach. No, 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 no. No. What we do is the most important task on the planet. I believe that. You don't have to believe that. You don't have to agree with that. That's okay. But what I'm doing, I personally believe, personally feel it is the most important task. Listen to what Christ himself said. He said, I will build my what? Church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Would you please tell me something else? a business, an investment, a franchise, a career where you have God promising to make sure it never fails? Can you tell me something else that was started and 2,000 years later it is still up and running and changing people's lives, not only in North Carolina, not only in the South, not only in the U.S., but around this entire globe? Can you tell me any other business, any other franchise where people are literally by the millions gathered all around this world this morning worshiping and serving and promoting and planning? I just watched... This past week, my son got a chance to be part of uh, the Passion Conference that took place in Atlanta. 65,000 young adults got together for two days to do nothing but worship and, and sing and learn and take notes and grow. They took up an offering to promote, and John sitting here, you'll appreciate this, they took up an offering to promote Bible translations in the, in the areas of the world who do not have a Bible in their own language, they took up $1.2 million in one offering. 65,000 college students, high school college students. Can you tell me something else that has that kind of promise and has that kind of backing that's been going on for 2,000 years? And listen, listen, listen. Never, ever, ever assume money equals importance. What are you talking about? 
this, I read a few weeks ago, one of the baseball players, I think his name is Garrett Cole, he recently signed a contract to play baseball. Are you ready for this? He will receive, he doesn't receive it like this, but you average it out. He will receive $100,000 per day, seven days a week per day for the next nine years <laughs> to hit and catch a ball. Think about that. You ready for this one? I want you to imagine you work 40 hours a week. Some of you are like, I do, I do work 40 hours a week. What do you mean imagine? Imagine you work 40 hours a week, you spend nothing. You put all of it in the bank, okay? No taxes are taken out and you have no expenditures, okay? And you get paid $2,000 per hour. And you started your job when Jesus Christ was on the earth. $2,000 per hour, 40 hours a week, you save every single dime, no taxes and no expenditures for 2,000 years. If that were true, you would be worth less than 10% of Jeff Bezos who owns Amazon. <laughs> and one of the top items Amazon sold in 2019 was Baby Yoda. <laughs> so, if money equaled importance, then hitting and catching a baseball and buying a Baby Yoda are the most important things in the world. But they aren't. The most important things in the world are people and they're infinitely valuable to the point that God himself came wrapped in human flesh and lived and died to redeem us and launched his church to reach and serve people. And that's what we're in, the people business. Money doesn't equal importance. So this series is not about how we can better serve you, believe it or not, because we do that all the time. We, we always are evaluating. This series is, is about how you can be a part of what's going on and how we can better partner with you so that you can be the most effective possibly, you, you, most effective person you possibly can be with the inside the most important thing in the world. That's church. And more specifically, we're talking about church with a small c. What I mean by that is not necessarily the universal church, but we're going to be very specific in this series to talk about the small church as in a local church. Because I spend a lot of time talking about big church, the universal church around the world. It's been a few years since we've talked about how we can all get together and do the best we possibly can for the small church, the local body of Christ represented here at Forest Park. So the balance of this message today, I want to examine one part of, of those four pillars that I mentioned to you a moment ago, and that's the radical message that Forest Park has. Now, as I mentioned, the radical message we present is one of the things that holds it up, supports it, and keeps everything going. But in order to truly participate, to, to fully engage, if you will, as a member of this church, a partner of this church, an owner of this church in many ways. You gotta commit your heart, your soul, your mind, every money, everything to it. You gotta know the message. You gotta know it inside and out. And you gotta know it carefully, even to the point where you yourself can share it with your family and friends and take that medical radical message and watch it change people's lives. So here's what I wanna do today. I'm just giving you a heads up, okay? I'm gonna do the next few minutes and I'm just gonna break that message down and I'm gonna let you see just how radical it really is and why it is Forest Park presents it, presents it, presents it and why we gotta to give to it and why we gotta serve for it and why we gotta show up to it and why we gotta do all the things that God has called us to do because the message is radical and it still changes lives. Are you following me? All right, good, thank you. Right here, front row. Holy people, godly people. What does that say for the back row? I don't know. <laughs> Romans chapter three, verse 21 to 26 
encapsulates this message, the radical message of Jesus in a beautiful way, beautiful way. This is the heart of the message. Here's the bottom line. Here's what you need to know. This is the message of Jesus stated as simply as I know how to state it. And what I want to do is break it down for you and make sure you understand it so you can take it and deposit it into other people's lives. Let's just jump into it, okay? But now God's righteousness. Stop right there. (laughs) Just stop. What in the world does righteousness mean? That's a big word. What does that mean? What does righteousness mean? Let me make it as simple as I know how. Righteousness means a right standing with God. Righteousness means a relationship with God that is so right that there is nothing between that person and God. It means a relationship with God that is so right that when you think about your relationship with God and how it's going, there's no stress, there's no fear, there's no worry. It is a message, it is a message, it is a righteousness, a right standing with God that says, you know what, you can look God in the eye and not blink. That's what it means. Righteousness means a right standing with God. The message of Forest Park presents is a message proclaiming that there is a right standing with God that every single person can have. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter from where you've come. No matter your hang-ups, bang-ups, or screw-ups, you can look God in the eye and not worry about what he's thinking. That's a radical message, folks. But let's keep reading. Because we got to know from where does this righteousness come? But now God's righteousness. Whose righteousness? God's righteousness. God's righteousness. Paul is saying this righteousness or this right standing with God is God's righteousness, not your righteousness or my righteousness. Folks, that is huge. Because the message we proclaim, this righteousness that puts us in right standing with God, is completely different than any message from any other religion. What do you mean, Scott? In all other religions, a right standing with God comes from me. It comes from my work, it comes from my effort, it comes from my turning over a new leaf, it comes from trying harder, and I'm telling you there are people all over this world today, January 5th, first Sunday in the new year, that is doing everything they possibly can to earn a righteousness with God. They're carrying guilt from 2019, they're carrying sin from 2019, they're carrying all the mess ups and bang ups from 2019, and they're showing up in churches all across this world today to do everything they can to go, you know what, finally this year I'm going to get right with God. Finally this year I'm going to do the right thing. Finally this year I'm going to stop these sins, I'm going to stop these hang ups, and you know what, that's a good thing, that's a wonderful thing. There are habits and there are hang ups and there are addictions that we have to actually get involved in and work on and we might have to go to counseling and we might have to join a group and we might have to learn some new things in our minds and our heart. Yes, 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 but there's a lot of people trying to earn this righteousness with God. In fact, you might be one of those people sitting here today. And you're doing your absolute best to turn over that new leaf and somehow get in this relationship with God in a right way. And Paul says, no, 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 you've missed it. The gospel is so much better news than that. The right standing with God, this righteousness that I'm talking about, doesn't come from our effort. It comes from God. And just in case anybody is confused, Paul makes it more clear by saying that this righteousness that comes from God has been revealed apart from the law. Apart from the law, apart from any effort from me. Paul is saying the message of Jesus is a, that a person can have this right standing with God comes from God and it has nothing to do with anything that I have ever done or that I ever will do. In other words, this rightness, this righteousness doesn't make you righteous, meaning that you work on it, your righteousness doesn't make you righteous. It is God's righteousness that is given to you, it's been revealed to you, and it comes apart from the law. 
Now notice Paul's words, this message, this right standing with God, this righteousness that comes from God apart from any rightness on our part has been revealed. Now why is that important? Because you and I did not know this until it was revealed. We are accustomed to people, systems, institutions, keeping track of what we do marking our rights and marking our wrongs and checking the lists and all those different things. And Paul comes along, this radical message, and says, listen, I want to talk to you guys about a righteousness. You all want to be righteous. I want to talk to you about a righteousness, okay? Number one, it's not your righteousness. It is God's righteousness. Number two, it has been revealed to you. You didn't know anything about this. This is brand new. It's like opening up a gift and you didn't even know you were getting it. It's been revealed to you, and you know what? It's been given to you and revealed to you apart from any of the works that you possibly can ever muster in your life, turning over new leaves, starting over again, trying harder. It is a righteousness that has been revealed to you and is given to you apart from the law. And I love this one word he uses as soon as I get to it. But now, we're going back, but now God's righteous. You know what that tells me? That tells me that it is an announcement that Paul is telling us about. Now, Hear ye, hear ye, front page news. Now there is a righteousness that comes from God apart from the law and it has been given to you. It is good news. Everything is different because of this. And then verse 21, he says, which is confirmed by the law and the prophets. You know what that means? No. Good, I'm gonna tell you. I'm playing and I'm just, if I was sitting out there, that would be the right answer to give me. Paul is saying that this right standing with God that comes from the law is not new. What do you mean it's not new? When God gave the law, way back then, it was never intended to be the final revelation about God and how mankind connects and relates to him. God always intended to give humans a right standing with him. And if you will read carefully the Old Testament, you will see that everything in the New Old Testament points to the righteousness that eventually will come. So it was confirmed by the law and the prophets. And Paul is telling this in case anybody says, man, this is a wacky message. This is a brand new message. This can't be true. This can't be right. Paul's like, no, 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 no. What I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's been revealed to you. It's been given to you. So it's new in the sense that you're experiencing experiencing it, but it was confirmed by the law and the prophets for hundreds and hundreds of years. This has always been about what God wanted to do, was to bring about this full revelation of who he is and bring to us this righteousness. It's good news. It's radical. You're living in a day and age where all the law and the prophets longed to see. They wanted to to participate in it, and you get to. That's what Paul's saying. Verse 22. God's righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain how incredible this message is right here. This will help give a little insight into why Forest Park says, or people say so often, I love Forest Park. This right standing with God that comes from God and comes to us, all of that comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Christ. Not through your faithfulness, because I'm going to tell you straight up, okay? I might shock a few of you. I'm not always faithful. I know. I know. That's shocking. I bumble. I fall. I mess up. I doubt. I sin. I struggle. I get up again. I start running the race again. I stumble again. I'm just not always faithful. Is there anybody else in this room this morning that's just not always faithful? Okay. Brad, our host? (laughs) You just disappointed me, man. I figured if they gave you a clicker, you'd be faithful. I'm just not always faithful. I I think, looking back, I'm more faithful today, you know, than than I was a few years ago. But that's, a lot of that is due to, you know, you put your hand on the stove and you burn yourself 
and then you put your hand on the stove and you burn yourself, you know, it doesn't take a genius to know not to put your hand on the stove again. So there are some things in my life I've learned, not because I'm so wonderful and because I'm just so amazing, it's just because I got tired of falling on my face over and over and over again, and I figured out, hey, if I keep doing that, I keep getting hurt, so maybe I should stop doing that, right? Right? But myself, left to myself, I bumble and stumble and fall. And unfortunately, though, this this message is so good because this righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. See, it's, it's not that I've been following him for, I don't even know now, I guess, 35 years from since I was a you know a child to today and uh, 40 years I guess close to that whatever and it, it's not that throughout those 40 years I have held on to his hand <laughs> the truth is is that through those 40 years he has held on to me does that make sense it's it's through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ not my faithfulness or are you saying faithfulness to Jesus isn't important? Of course it's important. That's a whole other message. Yes, that's important that we are faithful and that we are consistent. And Yes, yes, yes. But I'm talking about something bigger than that. I'm talking about above all of that is that he has held me. It even gets better. Really? Yeah. For all who have faith in him, there is no distinction. You know what what that means? That means this message is for anybody who believes. It's for anybody who places their confidence in God. It is for anybody who comes to the end of themselves and says, God, I can't come into a right relationship with you by myself. I don't have the skills, I don't have the willpower, I don't have the strength. I've got to trust you to make me right because I can't do it on my own. I love the fact that it says it's for all who have faith in him. Not for all who have enough money. Not for all who have enough willpower. Not for all who have enough confidence. Not for all who have enough education. Not for all who have enough whatever. It's for all who have faith. Because you know what? A person who's poor can have faith. A person who's rich can have faith. A person who speaks a different language can have faith. A person who is, who is challenged physically can have faith. It doesn't matter. That, it makes the, the playing field completely level. Because you can be anywhere in this world. You can have any kind of circumstances in your life. And you can trust. You can lean. You can have faith. And there is no distinction. None. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you. I'm telling you, when this clicks inside of you, when this really dawns on you, when you get this and you see this and you understand this message, it changes everything. Because there is a righteousness that comes from God God and it has nothing to do with you. It's apart from the law, apart from the effort and all you must do is lean into him, trust in him, fall into him and say, God, I can't do it on my own and in that moment you are made as righteous and as pure and as holy as you ever will be. And it doesn't matter if you're poor, it doesn't matter if you're rich, it doesn't matter if you live here or there or what your past looks like or what your present circumstances are like. You can have it all given to you by simply taking it. Wait a minute, Scott. Wait, wait, wait. I know the pushback because I've heard it. That sounds really good. But if you got to know the real me, you, you wouldn't preach like that. I mean, if you knew what was going on inside my heart, if you knew what was raging in my mind, if you knew my anger, my lust, my hatred, my jealousy, my unforgiveness, my past, my present, if you knew how unlike God I am, then you wouldn't be so quick to say all that you're saying up there. And here's where it gets really interesting. You see, this this whole thing we're talking about today just a little slice that I'm, I'm taking and dropping into you as we enter this new year. 
This, this whole thing is God's game, not our game, okay? And because it's God's game, it, it, it's played on God's field. And, and God established the rules. And God's the referee. This game's rigged. <laughs> kind of like some other NFL teams out there. <laughs> this game, I'll let you figure it out. I don't, I don't even know. I don't even like, necessarily like football. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's God's game. The only people... And according to God and his rule book and on his field, the only people who have received right standing relationship with God are not those who are perfect. That's according to God, not according to me. That's his rules played in his game on his field. The only people who get in are those who know they can't get in on their own. That's his rules, not mine. And the last time I checked, I'm not perfect. Neither are you. Now some of you are thinking, well... You're, 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 not, you're not perfect, like you're, you're imperfect, but I'm like really imperfect. Like I'm way out there, Scott. Nope. See, that, that's where we mess up. Paul says, according to God, the field is absolutely level because all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. If you have sinned one time, you are a See, you know, <laughs> you know, you know about yourself, don't you? The same as everybody else. And it doesn't matter what you've done. Listen to me. Okay, if you, if you will, look at me, all right? It doesn't matter what you've done. Yes, it matters in that we create consequences. Yes, it matters in that we create pain in other people's lives. Yes, it matters that we might have to pay restitution. We might have to pay for some of the things we've done. Yes, of course those things matter. But I'm talking about when it comes to receiving righteousness from God, it does not matter what you've done. I stand beside you, not above you beside you all have sinned and fall short of God's glory but here's the radical message all are treated as righteous every single one who leans into him Every single person who says, I can't, but you can. Every single person, it doesn't matter what you've done, where you live, who you are, what color skin you have, how much money you have in the bank, how much money you owe, it doesn't matter. All have sinned, and because of this righteousness that comes from God, apart from the law, all are treated as righteous. That means that all are made to have right standing with God. All. All. How are we made to have a right standing with God? Freely, by his grace, because of a ransom that was paid by Christ Jesus, not us. That's why it's good news, folks. Man, every sinner in this room ought to be rejoicing. <laughs> if you really, 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 really knew how corrupt we are and really, 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 really knew how righteous we now are, man, I'm telling you, we'd have a party every week. That's why it's good news, folks. It's good news because it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It doesn't matter your religious background. Everybody needs to be given a right standing with God because everybody has forfeited a right standing with God because everybody has sinned, and it's given to everybody. Yeah, but I've been divorced twice, and this third marriage isn't looking too good. But it isn't about you. It's about what he's done for you. Yeah, but I have a really bad temper. I, I live with someone and I'm not married. I aborted my baby to cover up my mistakes. I don't believe everything in the Bible. I love pornography. I'm married, but I don't love my spouse. There'll be days that I don't think God is real. Okay. Freely. By his grace. 
not because you clean up your act, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. You are given a righteousness that doesn't come from the law. It comes because he is good and he has given you the righteousness. And it goes the other way too. There's some of you, you don't find yourself on that list that I read because you are good. You got a wonderful job, you got a wonderful husband or wife, you got wonderful kids, you got a wonderful home, you got a wonderful income. Your whole life is just kind of floating on air and everything is just wonderful. And you, you, you got smart kids, and you got a successful career, and you kind of look down your nose at all the poor sinners among us. You get in the same way. Same way. It's all given to us freely by his grace. You're no better than me and I am no better than you. That is a radical message. So here, here's, here's the radical message, if you will, kind of in a nutshell, okay? Everyone can have a right standing with God that comes from God through faith in Jesus and you can be made righteous freely by his grace. You're not made righteous by your effort. Your effort won't cut it. Some of you are here today because you're trying to make up for last night. You're trying to make up for last week. You're trying to make up for last year. And you're trying to pay God back because deep down inside, you don't feel righteous before God. You are a long way in your mind from righteousness. And what you feel is the weight of debt you owe God. I gotta do something. My life is not the way it ought to be. I gotta clean up my act. So you come to church and you, you give money or you serve in a soup kitchen or you do something to assuage your guilt. And the debt's real. We do owe God. Man, we have messed things up, blown things, hurt people, run against every single thing that he's told us to do. We don't love. We have hatred and unforgiveness. We hurt our fellow brothers and sisters. We ruin families. We ruin children. We mess up the money and the, and the resources God has given to us. We destroy our earth. We kill people. We blow people up. We destroy churches. We mess up our cities. We get ourselves addicted. We, we just destroy, destroy, destroy. And yeah, we feel this guilt, this, this weight that something's not right, and we know that it ought to be right, but it isn't right, and we just feel so dirty. Good news. Every single bit that I just named times 10 was all paid for. And it's all been washed. And you can come in, even if you have to crawl, even if you have to drag yourself, you can come in. And you, as dirty as you feel, you, as weighed down as you feel, you, as messed up as you feel, you, as filthy as you feel, you can be made righteous. Not because of what you've done, but because of what has happened for you. He cleanses, he watches, he forgives, he justifies. Folks, that is incredible. And when that message really gets into the heart of an individual, everything changes. That's why we gotta keep doing what we do here at Force Park. That's why you have to get involved to help tell that story. That's why you gotta let your family and friends know and all your weird relatives, you gotta let them know. <laughs> Are you telling me my brother-in-law can actually be? Yeah, well, him too, you know? Well, Scott, where do we come in? I mean, you're the one who stands up and preaches. I, I guess that's what they call what you do. But we don't have that opportunity. I mean, we, 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 we work all week. We're in school all week. We, you know, I drive a truck, and she teaches a class, and we're not skilled communicators, and we're busy all week long. I get it. But I want you to listen to me very carefully as we wrap this up. That does not mean we're getting ready to leave. <laughs> so he's, he's wrapping it up. Let me get my key. No, no, just hang on. <laughs> hang on. When Jesus gave the final command to go into all the world and make disciples of all the people, of all the nations of the earth, no one, no one, Standing around that day, listening to Jesus, imagined a church building like this one. Nobody. 
They couldn't possibly fathom what we have today. Nope, nobody's standing there listening to Jesus when he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. No one imagined that somebody would be standing on a platform underneath lights with microphones and video projectors and online churches and none of them imagined that there would be something that you could get in and fly 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet above the earth and fly to other countries. Nobody, nobody even imagined that. What they understood Jesus to mean in that moment was for each individual person standing there to take what Jesus taught and teach it to their family and friends. They understood Jesus to say, support one another, get together as often as possible, strengthen one another, eat together, love each other, encourage each other, meet each other's needs, live this message out, not only among yourselves, but live it out in front of other people who don't understand it. And and, and if you will share it with your family and friends, and you will share it with your family and friends, and you will share it with your family and friends, and all of you will live it out among yourselves and live it out in front of everybody else who isn't in right now, we'll disciple the earth. We'll take it to the ends of the earth. And I think that when they walked away from Jesus teaching that day and they returned to their homes and they returned to their workplaces, I think they were excited but I think they were also a little fearful about how all that would go. They had just watched Jesus be crucified because of the message. And they they were probably a little intimidated, you know, by will will my family and friends believe it? Will they think I'm weird? We're aligning ourselves with the crucified one. But here we are, 2,000 years later, with hundreds and hundreds of millions of followers of Jesus around this planet. And some of us sitting in this room, we have the same mandate to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. And we're a little bit intimidated by that because we don't know how that's gonna work and we don't know if anybody's gonna believe us and, and we're a little fearful that we won't do a good job and people won't listen. So here's, here's what I wanna do to wrap up today's message. I was sitting in my office this week and I thought, you know, God, how do, I, how do I take all this and just make it palatable in the sense of just taking it and, and living it out in front of everybody? And I thought, well, what about this? What about, let's just adopt two prayers this year. Two prayers. Two prayers that we're gonna pray and we're gonna trust that God is gonna take and answer these prayers in profoundly amazing ways. And we're just going to watch what God does. So I'm going to give these two prayers to you, explain them, and then we're going to be finished for today, okay? The first prayer that I want Forest Park to pray, two prayers. The first prayer is open my eyes. Very simple prayer, but powerful. This is, this is Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19. Isaiah writes, forget what happened long ago. That's good news right there, isn't it? Forget what happened long ago. Don't think about the past. I am creating something new. There it is. Do you see it? I have put roads and deserts, streams, and thirsty lands. This tells me God provides opportunities everywhere. Even in the most difficult places, it isn't that those opportunities aren't present, it's that we don't see them. Isaiah is saying, listen, forget about yesterday, forget about the past, I'm doing something new. It's it's right there, do you see it? You know what that tells me? That there are some times God is doing something new and we don't see it. Opportunities and we don't see it. I put roads in deserts where you, where you never expected roads to be. There they are. I put streams in thirsty lands, places you've never expected there to be refreshment. There it is. But do you see it? So my, my prayer and what I want you to pray is pray. Listen, listen very carefully. 
pray not for opportunities. Opportunities are everywhere. Even in dry, desert, thirsty lands. Here's the prayer. Open my eyes that I might see them. What does that have to do with this radical message? You have opportunities at work, at school, in your community, on the golf course, while fishing, while hunting, while taking care of your kids. You have opportunities to take this radical message of Jesus and let people know. Pray that you will walk every day of this new year with your eyes open and look around. And if your eyes become open, you'll be blown away by the opportunities in front of you. Here's the next prayer. Make me brave. You see, seeing the opportunities is only half. We gotta seize the opportunities. That requires bravery. That requires courage. Let me give you this last passage. In the book of Acts, which chronicles the events of the early church, Peter and John, the first disciples of Jesus, were arrested and thrown in jail for proclaiming this radical message. Say, Scott, you have just burst my bubble. You want me to proclaim the message and now people are being thrown in jail because of it. Well, God miraculously rescues them how did they respond? I'll tell you how I would respond. Whew, man, I'm so glad I'm out of that. God help me to never, ever, ever get thrown back in jail again. Right? I'd have wrote a book about it. I'd travel around the nation, make millions of dollars selling a best-selling book on how I preached one message and got thrown in jail and God miraculously delivered me. I'd be on every conference in, in the entire evangelical world. I'd, I'd sign books afterwards and I'd make a million dollars and build a big home. That's what I would probably do, right? How did they respond? This blows my mind. Acts 23, verse 23, excuse me, Acts 4, verse 23 through 29. I'm going to read you a passage in just a moment, but I want to set this up. Here's what they, this, this is what happened when Peter and John gets out. As soon as Peter and John had been set free, they went back and told the others everything that the chief priests and the leaders said to them. When the rest of the Lord's followers heard this, they prayed together and said, listen, you can tell a lot about a person by listening to their prayers. A lot. Here's what they prayed when they got out of prison. Master, you created heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. And by the Holy Spirit, you spoke to your ancestor, David. He was your servant and you told him to say this. Why are the Gentiles so furious? Why do people make foolish plans? The kings of earth prepare for war and the rulers join together against the Lord and his Messiah. Does that sound like the way you pray? <laughs> Probably not. Here in Jerusalem, they continue. Herod and Pontius Pilate got together with the Gentiles. This is a prayer. They got together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Then they turned against your holy servant, Jesus, your chosen Messiah. They did what you in your power and wisdom had already decided would happen. And here's the final part of their prayer. Lord, listen to their threats. We are your servants. So make us brave enough to speak your message. Now, folks, that blows me away. Because my prayer would have been, whew, I'm so glad I'm out of that. God, I'll, if, if you will keep me out of prison, I'll do anything you want me to do, right? You know what they prayed? We're probably going to face it again. Give me bravery to keep speaking your message. They prayed not to be spared a rest again. They didn't pray, God, please don't allow that to ever happen to us again. God, please save us from Herod and Pilate and the people like him. No, they prayed for courage to speak the radical message. They prayed for bravery, for boldness, for endurance. What do their prayers reveal about the values of the early church? They expected opposition, but they valued courage. That's the two prayers that I want FPC to pray this year. God, open our eyes. God, make us brave. Let's take this radical message and do incredible things with it. 
bury it so deep within me I can't help but speak it to my sister, to my brother, to my neighbors, to my husband, to my wife, to my parents, to my kids, to my friends at school. God opened my eyes that I might see the opportunities all around me and that I might have the courage to stand and say, I'm going to speak this message. And watch what God does. Watch what he does. Wow. I want to pray. And then I got one thing I want to share with you before we go today, okay? Father, how amazing you are. How incredible you are. These two prayers I want to bury so deep within us that it literally shakes us and changes the direction in 2020 of Forest Park. God, I I pray that our eyes would become open that we might see the opportunities that are in front of us. They're everywhere. May we see them. And then, Father, we need courage. We need bravery that we might seize them and actually live them out. We need courage because many of us are afraid. We need courage because many of us do not think we can do it. God, give us courage. Courage. Courage that we can stand and proclaim this radical, life-changing message. There is a righteousness, a right standing with you, God, that comes from you apart from the law and is given to all people freely by what Jesus Christ has done. May we live it, may we sing it, may we speak it, and may we watch you do incredible things in the lives of our family, friends, and neighbors throughout 2020. I love this place. Now what? Let's take this message to as many people as we can. In Jesus' name, amen.